Lisa June. I'm Aaron Glassman. And today we are so thrilled to be sitting here with the exquisite Nalima Bhatt. Nalima is a visionary in the field of personal mastery, leadership, gender equality, and well-being. Um, she is the author of Shakti Leadership, Embracing Feminine and Masculine Power in Business. Um, she's also the, uh, the author of My Cancer is Me, The Journey from Illness to Wholeness. And um, by the way, I'm a big fan of Malima's, uh, Malima's work. And she was just letting us know that the big love of her life right now is her nine-month fellowship um, program with the University of San Diego, Advanced Leadership and Entrepreneurship Program. Welcome, Nalima. So happy to have you. Hello. So nice to be here with both of you, Anahita and Harin. Yes, direct from Mumbai, India. Welcome. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the uh, beginning question we've been asking all of our guests on this series is, what is iconic leadership to you? And who might be an iconic leader that's presently in your life that you can uh, speak into? Hmm. So iconic leadership for me is uh, someone who models both self-mastery and selfless service. I see those as two sides of the coin of conscious leadership. So someone who's done the inner work of self-transformation and self-mastery and then brings it in service of the world in a selfless way. So that to me is an iconic leader and who models it for me, being essentially someone who is um, <clears throat> very drawn from spirituality. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would cite the model or the example of um, the mother, Sri Aurobindo, these were spiritual leaders in the south of India. Um, they formed the uh, integral yoga uh, in this lovely little town called Pondicherry. And uh, the mother was uh, born Mira Alfasa. She was, um, I think she was Jewish actually. She was born uh, to wealthy banker parents in uh, Paris. Uh, and she was a spiritual master from the time she was born. And um, her entire work with Sri Aurobindo is about the evolution of consciousness and bringing in the new humanity. And the way she went about her mission was um, just astounding for me. So she's truly a mother, you know, someone who has the ability to include and hold the whole in this deeply compassionate way, even as you know, she's calling us to adventure all the time. Uh, in fact, the message of the day on my calendar says, the future is for those who have the soul of a hero. Yeah, um, how does one know that they've obtained a certain level of self-mastery? How is that defined for you? To me, it's defined by the quality of presence that they're able to hold. And uh, of course, you know, very, very, very few of us are enlightened. So we're not gonna be in this wonderful state of presence 24 seven, but as long as we can hold it more than we lose it, <laughs> I would say we're doing well. So the ability to be present is a state where um, you have nothing to defend, you have nothing to promote, and you have nothing to fear. And you're just standing in your spine and you're with your breath and um, you're just available to each moment. So to me, that is a quality of sufficient self-mastery where you don't let your thoughts take you over. You don't let your emotions take you over. And you know how to ride them. You know how to disengage from them even as you get triggered. You know, you can catch yourself and step back and and return to that place of equanimity or centeredness. So to me, that would be a, a sign of self-mastery. And how does one get there? Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> practice, practice, practice. What are your practices, Nalima? Um, so I'm a yogini. I'm a yoga practitioner, a yoga teacher. I trained in the Shivananda Yoga. And then I came to the integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. 
I've also done a lot of uh, Sufi practice, which is wonderful because it helps you fall into your center, even as it reminds you to, to stay foolish and silly and childlike. Um, so there are so many practices and so many paths. Um, Buddhist meditations such as metta, sitting and offering loving kindness to not just your friends, but also your enemies and wishing them well that, you know, may you be well and may you be happy and may you be free from all suffering. There are so many wonderful practices. Um, I would say mine is the practice of presence um, and surrender. To be in this conscious and constant contact with uh, the Divine Mother as a living presence inside and all around me and to be in an attitude of constant surrender uh, to her and to let her kind of be in charge of each thought, word, and deed. So. I'm, I'm glad you came back here, you know, in the beginning when you were speaking about Sri Aurobindo and the mother and the, that quality of the mother, and now you're speaking about the Divine Mother. And, and I'm just thinking about your book, Shakti Leadership, and I'm wondering what inspired you to write that book? What, why was it important to bring that conversation forward? So two things, actually. One is that I had spent um, a good 15 years or so of my journey um, doing yoga and the search for meaning and purpose and the inner journey. Uh, that was one which was my yogic path. And parallelly, I had been in the corporate world and, you know, I was, I was doing leadership. I had, you know, my husband and I set up a company, Roots and Wings, which we teach and train and coach conscious leadership. So there were these two parallel tracks of my life, the yoga and leadership. And then when we're talking conscious leadership as the latest model of leadership that the world needs, um, there's so many leadership models out there, but conscious leadership is this, is this new buzzword right now. And I realized the best way to offer a model for conscious leadership would be to bring together these two tracks, right? Which is the path of yoga and the path of leadership. So if I had to call this book by any other title, I would have called it the yoga of leadership. Mm. Yes. Like the Tao of physics. So all the principles of yoga, which is how do you find that inner self? How do you align your body, breath, and mind? Uh, how do you embody that presence in each moment? All that is very yogic, actually. And then you bring it to leadership moments, right? So um, I've, I've wanted to write the book Shakti Leadership and focus on Shakti as the power or the agency that a leader needs to be effective. And all leaders need power to be effective and to drive change, but the narrative on power is ego-based power, privilege-based power, and everyone's grabbing for power. And being a practitioner of yoga and a student of Mother Sri Aurobindo, this realization that there is Shakti, which is the source of all power, it's the source force, and there's enough for everyone, it's unlimited. <laughs> it's moving planets and galaxies and <laughs> neurons and thoughts and all the rest of it, and we're all busy fighting for each other for our little batteries that run out, you know, when we can plug into source. So recognizing that leadership is about the exercise of power to gain the agency needed to drive outcomes and therefore how do you tap into true power you know where you don't have to steal from someone else or make someone else less in any way for you to have power so that there is there is enough to go around there's enough for everyone so how do you do power with how do you do win-win power so that's how the book shakti leadership came to be written because i felt so strongly about changing the narrative on power um, it's the one thing that corrupts all of us. And we don't have to be corrupted when we can tap into source, right? Shakti power. Um, the other reason I also had to write the book is, you know, I said, 
I'm a woman, I'm an Indian woman, I was my mother's daughter. And as you start coming into your own, you start realizing all these toxic myths or falsehoods that you have bought. You know, you've been in the matrix, so to speak, and you didn't even know you're being had. <laughs> so as I started waking up to my inner patriarch, you know, what Sidra so Stone calls the shadow king, that to my shock and horror, I realized I had an inner patriarch, you know, who had been ruling me from the inside. And, and um, I guess this happens in your mid-40s for most women. I, that's where, you know, that awakening began as well, saying, oh my gosh, you know, women need to wake up, grow up, and show up, you know. And uh, Maureen Murdoch's book, The Heroine's Journey, was tremendous on, on this path. And she talks about the three falsehoods that women have bought and men have bought as well about women. The first is that women are inferior to men. You're just weaker sex. The second is uh, women are dependent on men. You, you're not anybody if you're not someone's daughter or someone's wife, right? And women are incomplete without men that, oh, you have to wait for night in shining armor to show up and until then you are sleeping beauty and only when he kisses you awake are you complete right the myth of romance and these three myths have kind of held women down and given us that inferiority so it's not serving us it's not serving the planet and uh, it's causing major trouble at this time that the loss of the feminine because of having been undervalued and devalued and repressed and suppressed and, you know, worse, you know, kind of systematically obliterated out of our culture and our psyche across the planet. It was just shocking when I woke up to these things and I said, you know, wow. And, and then there's Shakti, right? It was like the source force of it all, you know, everything at the end of the day bows at the feet of Shakti to get power. And so, so women need to come into the understanding of what true power is. It's a creative force and therefore it is feminine. And this feminine power needs to be brought back into leadership and into culture, not just through women, but also men. So it's regardless of gender. So that was the other reason to really talk to women and say, it's time for you to come into your own and to claim your true power because the world is, is going to go down without it, you know, um, if, if you don't bring it to the world at this time. The, the world is in a crisis and it's only going to be restored to balance by women waking up and bringing Shakti to the world and, and men too. But women, because of the inequality, need to come back into the economy, the ecology and technology and the peace process. <laughs> they need it everywhere. So that's why the book, Shakti Leadership. So it, was, it was written for both men and women on how to become whole and conscious leaders, integrated, balanced leaders. Uh, but I think it speaks more to women for precisely all the reasons that I called out. When you speak about uh, you know, women really stepping into their power and leading, leading from that true place of connection to power and Shakti, what are you finding is the thing that might be in the way for most women? For women? Mm -hmm. that, that same inner patriarch, you know, the unconscious bias that people are talking about, much of it comes from the conditioning inside their own heads, you know. Uh, it's thousands and thousands of years of conditioning that's come from mother to daughter to mother to daughter, right? So uh, don't, don't succeed don't outshine your man, you know, stay in your place, um, play small, serve, sacrifice, you know, uh, there, are, there are some very beautiful aspects to these behaviors, you know, that, that glorify the feminine actually, but if it's done to the neglect of self and self care, then it's, um, it's harmful for the woman and then for the family unit and then for society. So I think women have just bought into these ideas of uh, feminine inferiority and 
the need to self-sacrifice for for the men and for the family and uh, so that's that's one reason why they think it's not okay to claim power and to step into power you, it's also comfortable sometimes you know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. because you can end up rocking the boat and you know you're never popular for for rocking the boat and the whole family is so invested in you being in that sweet, special place of self-sacrifice. And um, so you get very unpopular. So just, a, just real quick, what would you say to partners, partners of women that are wanting to step into that place or shift out of that, um, you know, being guided by that inner patriarch to really stepping into power and freedom of expression and leadership, because I really hear you on saying it will rock the boat. I really hear that. So what can we say to the people that are in that boat? I would say to the spouses, the partners, that um, it's not really about you anymore at this time. And what you know, what the world needs is your woman uh, rising and, and coming into her own and for them to support her and to trust that such is the power and beauty of the feminine when it's fully awakened, that it gathers as it goes. It holds the whole, it takes everyone along. So it's not a personal ambition that she will set off on, on her own she will not neglect and you know leave behind uh the family and the love you know all that comes along so in fact i would just say you're going to give up ten dollars for the central bank you know so <laughs> don't worry <laughs> that's beautiful Ruth. Uh, Thank inclusivity you. of of the feminine rising yeah and you speak of, can you go into speaking about body intelligence and spiritual intelligence and how people can incorporate that and what does that mean? So most times when we hone our intelligence, it's the, you know, we just leverage the IQ we have. And then now there's talk of EQ, emotional intelligence. Of course, you know, we know the one thing that really derails us and our sanity on a daily basis is our emotional climate. So of course we need to master EQ and you know uh, hone that skill. But these these two bookends, which is BQ, body intelligence, and SQ, spiritual intelligence, on each side of IQ and EQ, uh, are are equally necessary to complete us as wholesome leaders. Um, Spiritual intelligence, to me, is foundational. That you can't really get to good EQ if you don't first have a sense of self that is deeper and beyond personality and ego, which would be your spiritual intelligence, your spiritual self, that uh, is your higher self, um, that knows and has a sense of meaning and purpose beyond self-interest, right? So until we can have a sense of connection to something deeper and beyond uh, the mini-me, uh, we can't really be showing up uh, in, in that self, selfless service way uh, in leadership, right? So to me, spiritual intelligence also in leadership, it's always about dilemmas and you know, values dilemmas, right? You know, should I choose this or should I choose that? And unless a leader has cultivated SQ and that place of non-attachment, a place of sufficient detachment, how is that leader going to make the right choice? So without spiritual intelligence, good leadership is not possible, is, is, is my take on it, you know, to make... To, to see the bigger picture and to therefore make the, make the right decision. So you need spiritual intelligence for that. And body intelligence is 
is what anchors your spiritual intelligence. So if you're not in your body, if you're not with your breath, and you're simply in your head, or worse, out of your head in the realms of, you know, spirit, so to speak, then it's an ungrounded spirituality and intelligence. And um, you're, you're not in touch with practical reality. You're not in touch with the here and now. And, and more importantly, you're not in touch with the feelings that move through the body and are giving you very important signals and information that you need to access and understand and decode in order to move through in, in a way that's right for you and for everyone, right? So body intelligence is, a body is as much of a data point as is our mind. So we, we value our mind because it's giving us insights, it's giving us direction, you know, we can tap into experience from the past in order to address a current situation. We don't realize that this body is constantly giving us information. Constantly. I mean, right this moment, if you were to check, am I feeling, you know, is my diaphragm tight, right? Or is my eye, eyelid, you know, kind of twitching a bit too much or whatever it is, like, in every moment, this body is at work constantly trying to bring itself to equilibrium. And therefore, wherever there is a thought or an emotion that is uh, blocking you in some way will have a somatic counterpart to it. And if we know how to follow the body and be aware of what's going on in the body and presence it in each moment, we can pick up such valuable information. The body is this incredible ally. So BQ is body intelligence. If you know how to read the language of the body, um, you have a whole new set of um, data points and information to be a more effective person and leader. Yes. Do you incorporate the power or an energy of, of anger? and how to navigate or utilize that in a way that transmutes but honors that full spectrum of the emotional human experience. Oh, absolutely. And um, anger is in a way, you know, trying to go from zero to 100 very quickly on learning emotional intelligence because anger is a tough one. It's easier to start with maybe a little bit of guilt or a little bit of shame or grief, but you know, anger, like so anger is that one thing that just takes us over, doesn't it? But yes, uh, maybe if everything begins with awareness. So if the first thing is to accept that anger is just another emotion, it's just energy moving in a particular way, emotion. And um, if I can insert pause, in the moment that anger rises, if I can insert pause and have sufficient ability to step back and presence it as just energy. So stop that feeling turning into a thought and a story. Because the minute you let the feeling get connected to a thought and a story which says, I'm angry because this, that, and the other, then there you know, you're gone because all you know everybody else becomes the bad guy and then you've been taken over by the emotion but if you can catch yourself before it moves into the why and the story of it and you can simply stay with it as a somatic experience in the body and go hmm what's what's this feeling like and you can just be with it and you can notice the heat, you can notice where it moves as you pay attention, it's seeking to go from one part of the body to, to another part of the body, because that's what the body does. It, it alchemizes, it digests emotion constantly, right? So if we can presence our anger instead of trying to follow the story behind it, it, it remains as energy and it actually then becomes fuel that is very much like um, 
excitement almost, you know, is like, a, is like, is, is vitality. It's just fuel that you can now use prana to, to do something and get things done and get up. And, you know, I mean, if, if before that you were feeling a little tamasic and, you know, inert and, you know, use this fuel now to get going and channel it into getting stuff done that maybe you'd been putting off. So that's one way to, to channel anger and presence it into something useful. Um, so many ways, so many ways. Yes, because don't you feel that, you know, this leadership needs a little fuel of being fueled by anger because I feel righteous anger. Yeah, if if we're not a little bit angry about the situation of the world, then we're shut off from some kind of energy that I that's wanting to move through us. Yes. So one of the things we talk about and you know when I say the sum total of the book uh, would be the the Mahavakya or the great statement called the wise fool of tough love. To become a, a Shakti leader, you have to have access to these four archetypal powers, right? Becoming wise like the parent, foolish like the inner child, you know, loving like the inner woman, but also tough like the inner man. So the tough energy is critical to be able to fight the good fight and draw those healthy boundaries and to say no and to not accept the unacceptable. So absolutely, we need, we need that sufficient righteous anger to call out wrongdoing and uh, to be able to actually uh, act against it. And for everything needs fuel, it needs energy, it needs power. So yes, that's how anger is necessary um, when you have to fight the good fight. How do you support people to strengthen in either of those four archetypal energies that may feel like it's a more of a challenge for them to be in, whether it's the inner woman or the inner man, or like, you know, people have their tendencies of where we're at home. So how do yeah. you support people to go into the places that aren't as naturally inclined to go? So it all begins again first with recognizing what is your core archetype and um, you know what is your preferred go-to, uh, which style do you tend to apply in, in challenging moments. Once you know what is your preferred style, that's good, that is a strength you have, but to know that you also need to have access to the other three. And the way to do that is simply practicing it, you know, trying it on for size and um, getting comfortable with the discomfort of it and saying, it's like bitter medicine in the, you know, it's, or it's, like, it's like riding a cycle, right? In the early days, you're going to fall and bruise yourself a little bit trying it on, but one day you master it and it just comes m more naturally. So... Again, everything begins with awareness. If you know this is a quality I need to dial up and I need to be able to access in the first place, then I need to practice it. I need to try it on. I need to express it in some way. I need to practice being more foolish. I need to practice being more loving, right? Um, another way that life comes back at us again and again, teaching us are these, we find these patterns, right? The same kind of situation starts happening. And it's a sign for us to say, oh, you know, you're over leveraging one aspect of yourself and you need to bring on the other. So when we start getting a few wax and uh, <laughs> the pain happens to a point where we say, oh, my, my preferred strategies aren't working, I have no choice but to hone some new skill sets, right? So practice it, don't wait to be whacked into learning it. Just try it on for size. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like so many people get lost in a, in a bit of a judgment as one being more important or better or more spiritual? Um, so perhaps practicing non-judgment or letting go of judgment around all those archetypes. Oh, yeah. I mean, 
when I talk about the polarity map in the book, you know, and when I apply it to myself, for me, my healthy feminine is compassion. I have the capacity for compassion and it's my antidote to my unhealthy masculine, which is judgment. <laughs> so, you know, it's so easy to judge, right? We're constantly judging and a part of us without even thinking about it is assuming we are so perfect that of course everyone else is, is imperfect and wrong, right? So <laughs> our default is to judge, which is unconsciously judge. And so now what I do is I catch myself and I find myself judging and I move across to the healthy feminine side and I bring on compassion, which is a quality I do have. So, you know, recognizing myself in, in that behavior sometimes. And yeah, so practicing uh, non-judgment, a good way would be to apply active compassion, actually. You know, um, it's like, but for the grace of God, go I, right? <laughs> but therefore, you know, see that this thing that that could be me too. Um, similarly, self care is uh, my antidote, my healthy masculine for the unhealthy feminine, which is getting needy and dependent, and you know, so which is again something I could judge myself for or judge others for, and then to bring myself to some self care or coach others to do their own self-care, model it for others. Yeah. Thank you. What do you feel like the world needs most right now to support us through birthing ourselves through this crisis point? I think, uh, the, the statement I just read out, you know, the soul of a hero, because um, the crisis is the start point of the hero's journey that Joseph Campbell so wonderfully laid out for us. So the crisis is a call to adventure. Whatever is out there as a crisis is our call to adventure. And so each of us needs to find our inner hero and to accept the call to adventure and accept the call to the journey and put ourselves in that discomfort and let go our comfort zones and familiar terrain and be willing to die in some way. Be willing to release and let go outdated modes of being and functioning, shedding skin. So the, the soul of a hero requires a lot of courage um, to face down our worst fears, um, to go into uncharted territories, to fight the good fight when needed. Um, so I think that's what the world needs. And while individually we are being called to find the hero within, I think collectively the other big quality that the world needs is just human kindness and compassion. Because there's a beautiful Kabir Doha. I don't know if you've heard of Kabir. He was a famous saint in India. And uh, I'll say it in Hindi. He says, Dharti aur asman ke chakki ke beech sabut bachana koi. Saying that, you know, the, the, the mill of life, there are these two big stones, right? And then the grain is put in between and then you move the big stone over it, right? So he says, between the two grindstones, the millstones of heaven and earth, Nobody, no seed remained untouched or unground, <laughs> right? That all of us, there's no one who can exist outside the sandwich of heaven and earth. And the two are like this mill and we all get crushed down and ground down. So no one out there is having a good life and a good time. You know, we're all suffering in, in our own ways no matter how wonderful our lives may look on Facebook. So <laughs> to, have, to have that understanding and compassion for, for the, the suffering of, of being human. Um, I mean, it's bad enough in good times, but in times of crisis, there is just tremendous suffering all around. 
so yeah, what we need most at this time is the soul and heart and courage of a hero and uh, the compassion and kindness to go around. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nalima, we so appreciate your work and just you being with us here. Uh, I know you have a beautiful presence, uh, a gift actually for this community. Will you share with us what that is? There is um, the master key to all the suffering and all the crises and everything, which is the ability to be present, the ability to unhook from the triggers and to step back and come into a place of centeredness. And um, Aaron asked earlier, how does one do that? And there's a practice. So just like, you know, you go to the gym and you can build a good bicep muscle. In the same way, if you do a practice regularly, you can cultivate the muscle of presence. And so it's a very simple practice. It draws mainly from yoga nidra um, and has put together some other elements. So um, body, breath, mind, heart, you know, senses. It engages us at all levels and then brings us to that still centered place. So that is a practice that takes about 10 to 12 minutes and I've recorded it like a guided uh, meditation, if you will, mind, like a mindfulness practice. And uh, I highly recommend you do it daily for 21 days, 42 days, because they say that's what it takes to build a habit. So how can we make presence our default state? How can we make it a habitual state instead of something we try and reach for once in a while? So. You know, you're welcome to practice with the audio as often as you can, at least once a day, I would say. Thank you so much. It's a beautiful gift. Yes, we so appreciate you. We so appreciate you being with us and everyone who's been tuning in. Um, this is such a potent and deep dialogue, so we know that you've enjoyed it. And um, yes, lots of deep gratitude. Thank you for being up late in Mumbai. I know it's late. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, Yes, Thank yeah. you both for the amazing work you're doing with this wonderful summit. Yeah. May it benefit many. Yes. 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 Uh -huh. Thank you. Bye-bye yes. now.